October 23rd, 2000. On this day, a web browser was released as part of the KDE desktop environment for Linux. Its name was Conqueror. Little did the developers know at the time, code from this browser would go on to conquer the web and be used in almost every popular browser. This is the story and legacy of Conqueror and the KHTML engine. Chapter 1, The Beginning In 1996, the KHTMLW, or KDE HTML widget, began as a precursor to the KHTML engine. As the name suggests, however, it wasn't a full web engine. It lacked support for JavaScript and CSS, and was behind in HTML support. This led to the creation of KHTML in 1998, and throughout 1998 and 2000, the engine continued to support more and more web standards such as JavaScript through KJS. Interestingly enough, KHTML actually implemented proper support for Hebrew and Arabic before Mozilla. Finally, the initial October release of Conqueror rolled around in KDE version 2.0. Conqueror was a default KDE application for both web browsing and file management. The name Conqueror comes from the names of the two dominant browsers at the time, the Navigator and the Explorer. According to the archived Conqueror FAQ, quote, After the Navigator and the Explorer comes the Conqueror. It's spelled with a K to show that it's part of KDE, end quote. This statement would prove to be prophetic. Chapter 2. The Forking In 2001, an Apple developer named Don Milton forked the KHTML and KJS engines and began to port them onto Mac OS X. Why KHTML and not Mozilla? The KHTML code was much smaller and easier to work with while still being very compatible with web standards. By 2003, the porting process was complete, and announced in an email to the KDE team shortly before Safari's release. The unmodified KHTML and KJS engines were developed for Qt, however, so WebCore and JavaScript Core were developed as adapter libraries. Safari 1.0, and with it the first stable version of WebKit, was originally released in 2003. At this point, the KHTML and WebKit teams had gotten along fairly well. However, by 2005, this had changed. Chapter 3. The Conflict For the first two years of Safari's existence, much of Apple's WebKit engine was closed source. WebCore and JavaScript Core, however, were open sourced by Apple. During these years, Apple gave back to the KHTML team by submitting patches to their project. However, the WebKit and KHTML teams didn't get along very well. According to developer Kurt Fiefel, Apple submitted patches that were, quote, in rather large chunks, with many single patches put into one, sometimes megabyte-sized, data blob. Additionally, the change logs for these patches contain references to Apple's internal bug reporting system. For this reason, development was very slow and time-consuming for the KDE developers, who began to voice their concerns in 2005. A month after FIFA's post on the KDE developer forums, Apple open-sourced the entirety of WebKit and added public access to their bug reporting system. Anyways, throughout this time, Safari kept gaining more and more features, and we'll talk about that after a brief word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by me. Did you really expect me to find a sponsor for my tiny ass YouTube channel? Hi, if you're enjoying the video so far, or you learned anything new, let me know by hitting the like button. This is my first documentary style video, and I've really enjoyed making it. So if you like it so far, let me know down in the comments. Oh, and subscribe while you're at it. Thanks! Now back to the video. Chapter 4. The WebKit As the years went by, Apple's WebKit engine and Safari browser continued to gain more features. Safari was ported to the original iPhone in 2007, and was even officially supported on Windows from 2007 to 2012. In 2009, the KJS-based JavaScript core was replaced with a much faster new JavaScript engine named Squirrelfish Extreme. In 2010, WebKit 2 was announced, a major update to WebKit that separated the UI and individual websites into their own processes for increased speed and stability. WebKit 2 was used for Safari and Mac OS X beginning in 2011 and iOS in 2014. From there, it's only introduced more and more features and become more secure, and currently holds a market share of 18.61% worldwide as of 2022. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound like world conquering, I hear you saying. That's because in 2006, the developer of a new, partially WebKit-based browser began. A browser that would take over the market. A browser that would be used as the basis for the browsers making up nearly 96% of global market share. That browser is Chromium. Chapter 5. The Forking. Again. Chromium development began at Google in 2006, 
and would power all versions of the consumer-facing Google Chrome browser. Chromium used the WebCore component of WebKit, along with their own JavaScript engine, known as V8, and multi-process architecture. Chromium was revolutionary in the fact that each tab was loaded in a separate process for the first time. This would later be implemented in WebKit, but on release it was the only browser to support this. On September 2nd, 2008, Google Chrome entered the public beta, and the underlying Chromium project was made open source. Chrome gained market share very fast, surpassing Safari in 2009, Firefox in 2011, and Internet Explorer in 2012. A year later, the web core component of WebKit used by Chrome and Chromium was forked into the Blink engine to make development of the multiprocessing engine easier. Since then, Chrome's market share has only increased, currently holding 65% of the market share overall. Not only that, many alternative browsers such as Brave, Vivaldi, Opera in 2013 and later, Samsung Internet along with the majority of Android browsers, and even Microsoft Edge from early 2020 onwards, use the Chromium engine. The only major browser that doesn't share a common relation with KHTML is Firefox. Speaking of KHTML, you don't really hear of it anymore. Why is that? Well... Chapter 6, The Death of KHTML After Apple stopped contributing to the KHTML project at some point after open sourcing WebKit, KHTML and Conqueror were rarely used. KHTML has poor support for HTML5, only scoring 77 out of 555 possible points on the HTML5 test, and modern versions of Conqueror seem to be even more broken than the older ones. The file management and FTP capabilities of Conqueror are now part of the Dolphin file manager, and Dolphin's been the default file manager on KDE since 2008. However, Conqueror was the default web browser on Hannah Montana Linux, so that makes it the best browser ever. By 2007, WebKit was technologically superior to KHTML due to the high number of full-time Apple developers working on it. For this reason, Qt WebKit was created in 2008, a port of WebKit to the KDE desktop environment in Qt. This engine was used in the Reconk browser from 2008 till its final release in 2014. In 2013, Qt Web Engine, based on Chromium, was developed and is used in Qt browsers like Falcon and Conqueror by default to this day. To be honest, it's kind of sad, the story of Conqueror. Some volunteer developers made a browser engine so good that Apple and Google continue to use code from it today in their story. The story of KHTML is mostly forgotten. Apple and Google didn't do anything illegal or against any licenses, this was fully within the LGPL, but Apple's behavior towards the Conqueror team was not particularly good, and Chromium's utter dominance in the browser market is definitely concerning and somewhat similar to Internet Explorer in the mid-2000s. That being said, unlike Internet Explorer, the Chromium engine is open source, generally fast and secure, and compliant with web standards, so the Chromium's dominance is not as bad as IE in my opinion. Still not great though. I hope you enjoyed this look at the story and legacy of the KHTML engine. The sources are linked down in the description, so if you want to learn more, check there. This is also my first ever documentary style video, so please leave your feedback down in the comment section. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the future.